Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one Tonight's night story, Cold Equations. There is no margin of safety along the rim of a frontier. There can't be any until the way is made for those who come later. Until then, the penalty for mistakes is a grim one. The laws of physical nature operate with irrevocable certainty, with no room for mercy, kindness, or sentimentality. In space, life becomes a cold equation, and the equal sign is often followed by death. I know. I'm the pilot of an EDS. Come in. You sent for me, Commander? Yes. Sit down, Barton. We just got an ED from the Territorial Space Station on Woden. Uh, Woden. That's in the Crab Nebula, isn't it? That's right. There are two exploration parties there on Manning's Continent. Eight men each. Mm -hmm. They've got cala fever in one of them and no serum. Oh, and I thought this was going to be a nice, quiet passenger run. Computers are working out your payload and your course right now. In exactly ten minutes, we'll drop in a normal space and launch your ship. I'll get her ready. One thing. What's that? Woden is at the maximum pay limit for an EDS. Figuring the weight of the serum, we'll be able to give you just enough fuel to land on Manning's continent if you make it the first pass. Otherwise, you'll burn out in midair. Mm-hmm. Standard procedure. Report to launching control. Right. Good luck, Barton. Thanks. Oh, uh, by the way. Yes? When can I expect to be picked up? We'll make a stop on the run back to Earth sometime next year. You'll be notified by radio. Okay. Sorry, we can't make it sooner. <laughs> That's what happens when you sign on for EDS work. I'll see you next year, Commander. <laughs> Down in the belly of the stardust, the crew was working like beavers to get the EDS, the emergency dispatch ship, ready. Mechanics and technicians were swarming all over the place. Girls in inspector's uniforms were checking the gauges in the supply cabinet. Nine minutes later, the exact course was in the computer. The serum was stowed in my supply cabinet closet, and little EDS 4G3 was ready to be born into space. Martin? Yes, sir? 30 seconds to blast off. All set? All set. I'm turning you over to traffic. Ready. Traffic control. Come in, EDS 4G3. Ready. 20 seconds. Lock open. 15 seconds. Space drive on. Space drive on. 10 seconds. Gravity neutralizer on. Neutralizer on. 5 seconds. 4, 3, 2, One, blast off! I don't remember how long it was afterwards that I first noticed something wrong. Maybe an hour, maybe two. There was nothing to show it except the needle and the heat gauge. It was on zero when we left the stardust, and now I noticed that it had crept up toward the 30 mark. That meant something inside the ship was radiating heat. That something was in the supply closet, and it was alive. All right, come out. Whoever or whatever you are, if you don't come out in five seconds, I'm going to blast you. One, two. Well, I'll be... Hello, I'm Marilyn Lee Cross. What are you doing in there? 
I'm a stowaway. Oh, my... What's the matter? Do I have to pay a fine or something? What are you doing here? I wanted to see my husband. Who's your husband? He's with the government survey crew on Woden. I haven't seen him since he left Earth four years ago. Okay. But what made you hide in my EDS? I have a job waiting for me on Mimir. But I heard you were going to Woden and there was plenty of room, so I hid. Oh, I knew I'd be breaking some kind of rule, but uh, what's one little rule? What's one little rule? H amount of fuel will power an EDS with a mass of M safely to its destination. H amount of fuel will not power an EDS with a mass of M plus X safely to its destination. Well, how could she be expected to know? She was 5'2 with brown curly hair and the faint sweet smell of perfume. She was 5'2 and she smelled like apple blossoms. And her name was X in an equation that would have to be balanced. Stardust. Come in, EDS. Come in. This is Barton, emergency dispatch pilot, 4G3. Go ahead. Give me Commander Delhart. What's the message, EDS? I have to consult Commander Delhart. The commander is busy. Listen, you squirt. Give me Commander Delhart. One moment, 4G3. Commander Delhart, emergency message from EGS, 4G3. This is Delhart. What is it? At 0800 hours, I discovered... A stowaway aboard my ship. A stowaway? Yes, sir. Well, have you notified ship's records? Not yet, sir. You know the regulations as well as I do. Of course I know the regulations. That's why I'm calling. Martin, what's going on? Sir, this is a girl. A young woman. Oh. She wanted to see her husband on Woden. She didn't know what she was doing. I see. I wondered, sir, maybe the cruiser could... Change course or something? I'm afraid not. We're hundreds of light years apart now. We have a limited fuel supply ourselves with 900 passengers. Is there any chance? No. Okay, Skipper. Better get the information to ship's records. Okay. Martin. Skipper. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. our acceleration, didn't you? Yes. Why? Well, save fuel for a while. How did you manage to stow away? Well, I was taking a language lesson in Mimiris from a girl in the inspection corps. The order came in for your trip, and I just went along on an impulse. Well, it was easy. I'll be a model prisoner, I promise. Well, if you were only a thief or a spy, it would make it easier. Make what easier? Uh, forget it. <laughs> Why couldn't she have been somebody with some ulterior motive, a fugitive, hoping to lose himself in a raw new world, a, a, a crackpot with a mission? Why did she have to be a woman, a beautiful, kind, trusting woman? Stardust. Barton, EDS, 4G3. Go ahead, 4G3. Identify a stowaway. Uh, give me your identification disc, Miss Cross. Here. Why? Well, it's for ship's records. Uh, identification number T-8374. One moment. This is for the gray card, of course. Yes. I'll need the time of... I'll tell you later. That's highly irregular. Then we'll do it in a highly irregular manner. The subject is a young woman. She's listening to everything that's said. Are you capable of understanding that? Oh. Go ahead, 4G3. Number T-8374... Dash Y54. Name Marilyn Lee Cross. Female. Married. Born July 7th, 2160. Good Lord, you're only a child. <laughs> uh, height 5 feet 2 inches. Weight 110. Hair brown. Eyes blue. Complexion light. Blood type O. Original destination Port City Mimir. Uh, listen, I'll call you back later. Look, miss. Marilyn. Look, Marilyn. I, I guess you don't know what you got yourself into here. Well, it's like this. This ship is carrying Cala fever serum to the survey group on Woden. Yes. 
Their supply was wrecked in a tornado. The fever is always fatal unless the serum is given in the first 48 hours. Now, these little ships have exactly enough fuel to reach their destination. If you stay aboard her, your added weight will cause it to use up all its fuel before it can land. What happens then? We crash. You die, I die, and six fever victims on Woden die. Can't they send out another ship to meet us? There are no ships to send. Well, I... Oh, no. Oh, no, you you couldn't do that. That's how it has to be. But that's crazy. I haven't done anything. I I haven't hurt anybody. I'm sorry. I I, I should have told you before, but I, I wanted to make sure there was no other way. You mean it? You're going to make me leave this ship? That's how it is. But I'll die. I'll explode. I'll be like those horrible pictures of... Try to understand. I do understand. You're going to kill me and I didn't do anything. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with it. Nobody just dies like that for no reason. Oh, listen. Maybe there are other cruisers. Cruisers you don't know about. Maybe the radio. Maybe it... Now, listen to me. (laughs) It's different here. Different from anything you've ever known. On Woden, there are 16 men. 16 men on an entire world. They're fighting. Fighting an alien environment. The environment fights back. You can only make a mistake once. I made a mistake. Yes. There's no hope. Absolutely none. You'll have to be put out of the ship. It was better so. With the going of all hope would go the fear. Then would come the resignation. She needed time, and there was so little. EDS. Starship to EDS. Need pertinent data. All right, Starship. When do you expect to complete your report? I... I need a computer check. I'll give you statistics. Statistics. This is EDS 4G3. I'm intersecting course vector 7.3 at 0831. Deceleration 1750, weight one ton. I would like to stay at point 10 as long as the computers allow. Will you give them the question? Check, I'll call you back. We wouldn't have long to wait. The new factors would be fed into the steel maw of the computer bank and the electrical impulses would go through the complex circuits. Here and there, a relay would click, a tiny cog turn over. But it would be the current, formless, mindless, invisible, which would determine with utter precision how long the pale young girl beside me would live. Five little segments of metal in the second bank would trip against an inked ribbon, and the machine would spit out the answer. You will resume deceleration at 1910. It was 1810 when he spoke. One hour. She has one hour to live. That's it. All I did was hide in a closet. And now you tell me I have to die. I don't believe it. You might as well get used to it. If this this happened back on Earth, a thousand ships would fill the sky. The whole world would know about it. They'd do everything to save me. This isn't Earth. It was such a big dream. Jerry and I separated almost five years ago. We were too young. And I was going to see him to try to make everything all right again. I... Are you married? I was. Oh? She ran off with some guy in the weather service. Do you still think about it? I don't let myself. Where is she? Back on Earth. Look, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon talk about something else. Okay. What do you do when you've got an hour to live? What do you talk about? What's Jerry like? Jerry? Oh, he's a funny guy. When he found out, I, I mean about the other fella, he didn't get mad. He, he cried. That was all he felt, sadness. So you walked all over him? Oh, I thought I wanted him to get mad at me, to, to be jealous. And now? 
thinking about him for five years. So when I heard the ship was bound for Woden and I knew Jerry was there, I stowed away. I didn't know about the fuel. I didn't know this would happen to me. She had violated a man-made law that said keep out. The penalty was not of man's making or desire. It was not a penalty men could revoke. H amount of fuel will power an EDS with a mass of M safely to its destination. The time was 1830. 40 minutes. It was beginning to get me. A space frontier is a rough place, and I'd seen a hundred men die since I left Earth. But this was different. I watched her as she wrote a message to her folks. I watched her as she fought her way through the black horror of fear toward the calm gray of acceptance. And then there it was on the view screen, the planet Woden, a red ball enshrouded in the blue haze of its atmosphere, swimming in space against the background of star-sprinkled blackness. The chronometer on the instrument panel said 1845. Listen, we're in radio range of Woden now. I mean, would you want me to try to contact your husband? Jerry? It'd mean... He would know you're going to die. There'd be nothing anyone can do. Yes. I would like to talk to him. Do you think we can? Well, the planet is turning. If his group is on the side facing us, we might be able to reach him. Oh, try. All right. Hello. Hello, Woden. EDS to government survey group. Can you hear me? Come in, Woden. <laughs> they may not be monitoring. Hello. 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 Identify yourself, please. This is Government Survey Group 1 on Planet Woden. This is John Barton, EDS pilot. Do you have the serum? Yes. How bad is it? One man died last night. Six have the fever. How long will it take to... I start deceleration at 1910 hours. I should be able to land at 1930. Thank God. Uh, look, do you have a Gerald Cross in charge of the group? Commander Cross? Yes, we do. Could I speak to him? He isn't here. He's out with the survey team. Well, when do you expect him? Can't say. How do you read me? How much time do we have left for communication? Less than 15 minutes. All right. If Commander Cross comes back before we lose radio contact, will you have him buzz me? It's important. Okay, EDS. I'll keep the set open. Check. The minutes passed like small bits of eternity. On the view screen, I could see Manning's continent sprawled like a gigantic hourglass in the eastern sea. There was a thin line of shadow where it was beginning to disappear as the planet turned on its axis. I looked at the pale woman next to me, and I thought of another woman long ago who'd sat next to me and cried because I wouldn't try to understand. What had she written in those letters back home? What would they think of the faceless, unknown pilot who'd sent her to her death? What would I think of myself alone nights reliving this voyage? cold, isn't it? I'll turn up the thermostat. Nothing from Jerry? We have about two minutes of radio contact left. Maybe it's better. I mean, suppose it were you and your wife tried to call you. How would you feel? I don't know. Do you ever hear from her? I got a letter about a year ago. I tore it up. That was foolish. Yeah, it was. Life is so terribly short be wandering around alone. Well, I, I... Wait a second, we're getting something. How much time before... before I have to leave the ship? About ten minutes. Hello, EDS. Hello, EDS. Come in. Come in. EDS. This is Woden. I have Commander Cross. All right, go ahead. Hello, this is Commander Cross. Jerry Cross? Yes. I have someone for you. Go ahead. Hello. Jerry? Hello? Jerry? Who is it? It's me, Marilyn. Marilyn? I wanted to see you again. I stowed away on the EDS. You what? But Marilyn... It doesn't matter, Jerry. All that matters is that I can tell you all the things I've kept inside for so long. Jerry, I want you to know I, I've i never forgotten. Oh, it's been so many years. I, I can't believe it. I thought I'd see you again, but now I can't. Jerry, you, you don't hate me, do you? Hate you? 
Marilyn, I've never stopped loving you. Not for an instant. Oh, Jerry. Listen, we don't have much time. The transmission is getting fuzzy. Oh, Marilyn, I've got to see you. There's got to be some way. But there isn't. Let me talk to the pilot. Give it to me. Hello? Pilot, have you called the mothership? Did you have them checked with the computers? I've done everything. You've been on the frontier long enough to know the setup in an EDS. Oh, dear God, there must be something, some way. Do you think I'd let this happen if I wasn't sure? He tried to help me, Jerry. He tried. And it really doesn't matter. I'm not frightened anymore. Not now. But how did you get here? I don't understand. Well, I was going to Mimir to take a job, I thought. And now I realize it was... I was just going because I'd be closer to where you were. Oh, Jerry, all this time... Don't. Let me tell you something. Marilyn, I've always known you'd come back to me. I've known it every minute. It's what's kept me alive. I want you to hold that in your mind. Jerry, I, I can't hear you. We haven't much time. We're losing radio contact. Jerry! Oh, don't cry, darling. Just know how I feel. I do. It's fading. There are so many things to say. Jerry, if you can still hear me, maybe I'll come to see you again. Maybe I'll come to you in your, in your dreams or, or be the touch of a breeze or one of those golden-winged little birds singing my silly head off. Maybe I'll be nothing you can see or hear, but you'll know I'm there. Think of me like that, Jerry. Goodbye. Goodbye, my darling. She sat motionless in the hush that followed. And then she looked at me. Now? Now. I pulled down the black lever, and the inner door of the lock slid open. She walked with her head up and the brown curls brushing her shoulders. I let her do it alone. She stepped into the lock and turned to face me, and I could see the pulse in her throat. I'm ready. I pulled the red lever, and there was a slight waver as the air gushed out. I thought I sensed a bump, as if something had bumped the outer door. And then there was nothing. The white hand of the closet temperature control was back at zero. A cold equation had been balanced, and I was alone in the ship. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Cold Equations, written by Tom Godwin and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured on the cast were Court Benson as Barton, Jay Meredith as Marilyn, Milo Bolton as Commander Delhart, Bob Hastings as Jerry Cross, Jack Arthur as traffic control officer, and Walter Kinsella as the Woden Monitor. Your announcer, Bill Rippey, X-1 was directed by Ken McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, in the days of the Windjammers... Whalers sometimes went on cruises that lasted as long as two years, and so sometimes they had to resort to rough methods to gather a crew. But what of the future, when a cruise to a distant star may last for 15 years or more? We hear of such a voyage next week on... X... 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 Minus... 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 One... 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 Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, 
Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents X minus one. Tonight's story: Shanghai. <laughs> Okay, okay, very funny, very funny. Take it over, boy. Tomorrow the old ball and chain. Yeah. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you commit matrimony. <laughs> now, come on, now, look. Oh, come on. We came down here to Scully Square to have a little fun. We might as well be at my mother's music hall in Beacon Street. <laughs> oh, the problems of the rich. Hey, tell me, Jeff, just where does the coffin fortune come from? Pirate treasure? No, no, I guess it started in Nantucket, my... Great, great something or other used to be a whaler. A whaler, the <laughs> she blows. A dead whale or a stove boat. Watch my trusty harpoon. <laughs> hey, 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 we'll look out for the porn. Oh, my. Hey, where's the money now? Oh, I don't know. We've got a lot of commercial holdings, mills, import, export outfits, rocket lines, you know. Mere trivia. <laughs> All right, now look, why don't we get out of this dump? We go up to the Copley Plaza. It may be stuffy, but at least the glasses are clean. Well, you're the condemned man. All right, you two go ahead and get in the car. I'll settle. All right, meet you out in front. Right. Uh, excuse me. Uh, you want something, bud? Yeah, the check. Okay, okay. Hey, Milton, check. He'll be right out. Right, thank you. Hello, mate. Nice night, eh? Hmm? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. I've been watching you. Celebrating? Sort of. Yeah, so am I. Just got off a deep space run out to Centaurus. Oh, that's a 15-year run, isn't it? Fifteen and three blooming months. Mm -hmm. How'd you know? You a spaceman? No, no, not exactly. Uh, where's that check, barkeep? Hang on to your hat, bud. Milton's slow, but he's sure... Uh, fill it up, Charlie. <laughs> Say, why don't you join me, mighty? Here, yeah, Charlie. Oh, oh no, yeah. no, no, thank you. Oh, come on, won't take off him, oh. Well... Celebrate whatever it is you're celebrating on me. Pour it, Charlie. Okay. Well, all right, thank you. I guess I might as well. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah, right, cheers. <laughs> oh, what was that, Marty? <laughs> Charlie speaks with bread, <laughs> eh, Charlie? Yeah. Well, oh, say, look, Charlie, would you get that uh, waiter out here? I've got to meet I, uh... Hey, what's your hurry, mate? you got plenty of time. Uh, well... Sure. Sit down. Take huh? it easy. You don't look so good. No, no, I, I don't feel uh, so good. Uh, yeah, now, sit right here. You feel chipper as a blooming grasshopper in a well, sec. Uh, no, I, I've got to get outside. The car's in a hurry. Where, where, where's the check? The check? Uh, oh. Uh, Up on your feet, wakey, wakey, uh, wakey. Oh, oh, right, let go of me. What's the idea? Rise oh. and shine and greet the dawn. What? Where am I? What's going on here? Now, come on now, matey. Up in there. Wakey, wakey, wakey. No, wait a minute. So you were at that bar at Scully Square. Come on now. Up on deck or you'll be in trouble. Deck? What are you talking about? Where am I? It's hard to say exactly. Offhand, about eight hours out of Atlantic Spaceport. Atlantic Spaceport? Now, look, what kind of a joke is this? If, if Alan and Peter think this is funny... What what uh, what ship is this? R.S. Michael M. Rafferty, coffin line. Oh, coffin line. Well, that makes it easy. Now, you've got to put back to port. Hey, forget your toothbrush, Bank. No, 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 listen, you runt. You take me hey, to the captain hey, or I'll tell you Hey, 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 I'll my jacket. All right, get moving. Hey, sure. Sure, my dear. I'll take it to the captain. Bet you're going to be sorry. Morton, what the devil are you doing on the bridge? Get below before right away, I... Right sir. Only this here gentleman asked to see you. Yeah, that's right, uh, Captain. There's been a mistake made. I'm afraid it was supposed to be a joke. Oh? Yes, you see... I'm going to be married today, and I suppose the boys thought it'd be funny to make me miss the ceremony. I'm sure it won't be too much trouble to have you drop me off back at the Atlantic Spaceport. What? Morton, what is this? Well, simple, Captain. He wants you to turn the ship around, that's all. Now, look, if there's any uh, trouble with your superior, I'm sure I can fix it up. 
You see, I'm Jeff Coffin. Yeah? Well, you don't understand. My father is Cyrus Coffin. He owns this ship. Oh, he does, huh? Morton, get this drunk along. Now, just a minute. I can understand you're not believing me, but I can identify my... Hey, where's my wallet? I've been robbed. Oh, now, look, Captain, wait a minute. All you have to do is radio back and check. Mr. Black, remove this man from the bridge. Yes, but... Aye, sir. You're the Captain Buster. Oh, now, wait a minute. Let go of me. This is no way to treat a passenger. Passenger? Huh. Wake up, sonny boy. You're one of the crew. Now, get below. <laughs> All right now, mate. Grab yourself a buffer. Get to work on this deck, plate. No, they can't get away with this. This is kidnapping. Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Now get this here deck nice and shiny, and we might even see about some grub. I'll be back in two hours. And mind you, I want to be able to see me blooming reflection in it. You better polish that deck plate. They can't get away with this. Well, the law says once you sign on, you're under absolute orders. I looked it up. Yeah, but I didn't sign on. I was kidnapped. You won't be able to prove it. Come on, mister, please. I didn't get anything to eat yet today, so give me a break, huh? All right. What do you do, run the buffer over it? Yeah, that's right. Like this. You sign on? Yeah, I ran away from home. How old are you? Sixteen. Thirty when we get back. Yeah. What do you mean, thirty? We're headed for Mars, aren't we? Only to refuel. We're outbound to Centaurus. Oh, no, it can't be. <laughs> well, that's a 15-year run. Morton! I've got to get back. It's no use. I'm getting married. My bride to be will think I'm dead. Martin! Martin! Yeah, what's up here? Yeah. You want me to call Mr. Black again? He'll give you what listen, for. Listen, listen to me, Morton. Listen, I've got to get back to Earth. I can't disappear for 15 years. Oh, is that the fact? Look, we stop at Mars, right? Yes, and you'll be below decks under lock and key. Listen to me. If I can make it worth your while, if, will you get me off at Mars, Port? <laughs> Jump and shiver. That's real naughty, mate. $1,000? Why, what would I tell me poor old mother in yeah. better say? Two thousand. Five in advance. What do you mean in advance? You're probably the one that rolled me for my wallet. I'll find a way. They don't believe your young coffin, but uh, maybe I know better. All right, it's a deal. Look, Mr. Coffin, can you take me with you? I didn't realize what it would be like. I, I can pay my share. I, I I could work it out for you or maybe borrow money. I, I, I couldn't stand 15 years. I'd go crazy. All right, all right, sure. What about it, Morton? Boy, will cost you another thousand. Oh, you cheap swindle. Here now, Mr. Coffin. I'm all what stands between you and a lovely pleasure cruise for 15 years. So I thank you to treat me with a respect and politeness what a gentleman like myself deserves. <laughs> Procedure. All right, now. Listen careful. This is the cable locker for the grappling anchor. Right. When she lands, this hatch will open. Cables go out. Don't get yourself caught in them. You'll be tore apart. All right, we've got that. Are you sure we can get out? Now, you just do what I say. We drop down to the blast pit. Nobody will be there. I low in the pit till dark. Got that? Right. Now, look, Morton, I'll tell the patrol you helped us get away. That'll help you when they catch up with this game. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you kindly. I've got to get to my station now. Luck. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Morton. Well, there's a landing horn. Now, keep clear of that cable, Joey. Here we go. Right. Hold on tight. There goes the grappling cable. Yeah. All right, come on. Drop through the hatch. It's about six feet. All right, it's clear. Hurry up. Here I come. Oh. You all right? I twisted my ankle. It's all right. All right, that's the blast pit. Get going. All right. Now we're all right so far. The ship hides us. Here's the pit. All right, now get down so they can't see you. Wait a minute. I hear somebody coming. Keep still. Maybe we better look. Look, if we stick our heads up over the edge, they'll see us sure. Now keep down and keep still. Well, well, well. 
Look what we have here. Two little babes in the wood. Now you two move and I'll shoot you in the belly. Morton, you got good eyes. I told you I saw him coming this way, Mr. Black. Jumping ship. My, that's a terrible thing to do. Mr. Black, inform the ship's company that these two men have been found guilty of attempted desertion. Desertion? You kidnapped me, you dirty crook. Don't you talk to Captain Howell that way. I'm sentencing them to 24 hours hull watch. Take them away. Morton, take them to the aft lock. I said... Calm down after 24 hours hull watch. What's hull watch? Very simple. We put you two in space suits, shove you through the airlock on the end of a line. You sit out there and watch the Earl for 24 hours. No food, no water, and the eating units in those suits are just a little bit defective. Makes it interesting along about the 18th hour. Yeah, I'll bet. Here we are, gentlemen. The airlock. You get in there. Got five minutes to get into them suits before we blow the air out. See you in 24 hours. Maybe. Welcome back to our little home. Water. Water. Thirsty, eh? You should control these animals' instincts. Get water. Right, yeah? Yeah. (laughs) Slopping like a bloody head. Joy. Joy passed out. Help him. He'll be all right. Teach a lesson, both of you. Take my advice and behave yourself. You've got 15 years to go on this here ship. You might as well make the best of it. Hey, Martin! What do you call this mess? That's your supper, mighty food concentrates. What's the idea? Only two months out and on concentrates already? You complaining, right? Yeah, I'm complaining. If Captain Howell's chiseling on the manifest, that's his business. But when he tries to take it out in our house... You keep quiet or I'll turn you into Mr. Black. Concentrate is what you get to eat from here on out. Now shove it into your face and keep quiet. Suppose I shove it into your face and see how you like it. What's going on in here? What's going on? He Morton. struck me. He struck me, Arch. What? 48 hours hull watch. All right, what are you all looking at? Get back into your places. Morton, bring that man down to the aft airlock. It's murder. That's what. Plain murder. Space code gives a 30-hour limit for punishment. They didn't even have a burial. Just shoved them out the lock. Well, if the owners knew about this, they'd stop it. A uh, fat lot of good that's going to do us during the next 15 years. Yes, Wait a minute. If we could get the ship back to Mars. No, two weeks after we landed, we'd be hung. That's what space code says about mutiny. And if they catch you in the act, they shoot you down and no questions. All right, I'm willing to take yeah. that chance. We're going to let Black and Howell kick us around for 15 years? Why don't we take over and head back? Right. I'm for right. it. Let's go. You bet. Yeah. Go I interrupt something, gentlemen? Discussion? Talking about the captain, maybe? Grab him. Here, Get up. Here. Slug him. Slug him. Jet. Come on. I'll have you all out of the island shifts. I'll see you on half rations. That's what I'll... Yeah, I'll... show him my oil rag, Morton. Well, that's done it. He's an officer. Who cares? Yeah, we've got to move now. Joey? Yeah? You get up to the radio room and smash the set before they can get a message out. Right. Pop, you get aft. Tell the engine watch. Yes. The rest of us will go up on the bridge. How about this rat? Tie him up. Speed counts now. We've got to take over before they know what hit him. Or 
Hey, careful. We've got to surprise him. Don't worry. We'll get him cold. Jeff, shh, quiet. Sparks was sending when I got in, but I knocked him out and smashed the set. We're okay. Good boy. All right, come on. Right past the bulkhead. Look out! The blast bulkhead. Yeah, we're cut off from the bridge. We'll never get through that. Yeah, they must have found out somehow. The intercom. Black can turn it on from the bridge. You heard the whole thing. Well, we better get out of here. What'll they do? I don't know. We've got all the controls up there. We can shut down the driver, but we can't steer. Yeah. You better dog down the hatch behind us. All right, men. Captain Howell's giving you one minute to give up quiet. In a pig's eye, Black. You'll hang for mutiny, every one of you. What do we do now? Quiet. They can hear everything on the intercom. Not if I pull the jack out. That's it, boy. Yeah. Look, we've got to get through to the bridge. It's a Mexican standoff. We can't get at them. They can't get at us. Yeah. What's that? It's an air leak. The pressure's down. It's Howell. He blew the hatch on the mess hall section. Just opened her up and let the air out. Morton, do you know what Black's going to do? He's going to bleed off the air down here. Save you all right. If I had my way, I'd see you all out on the hull till you froze stiff. You're forgetting something, Morton. You're back here with us. What do you mean? If Black and Howell blow out compartments one by one or bleed the air off, you'll get it too. <laughs> They'll take care of me. Don't you worry about that. Oh, you think so, huh? Joey, yeah. plug that intercom back in. Right. Captain? Captain? Give me up. We've got Morton back here. Yeah? If you try anything on us, he'll get it too. What am I supposed to do, cry? You don't care if he dies? That's his problem. We're going to drop the oxygen level 5%. Can't do that to me. Captain! Captain! It's unfortunate that you were Captain Morton, but the security of my ship comes first. You mean you don't care? You'd see me dead. Precisely. Well, you can't. It's murder, that's what. I'm not one of them. You can't kill me. You can't. Joey, pull the intercom plug. All right, there you are, Morton. They'd kill you just as soon as look at you. Now, listen, we've got to get through that bulkhead. You know this ship. There must be some way. Morton... We're your only chance. Get us through the bulkhead. All right. All right. Why shouldn't I? They'd kill me. Well, then there is a way to get through. An emergency release. Uh -huh. They don't tell crewmen about it to keep them from breaking through in an engine blast and leaking radiation to the bridge. Well, then let's get going. We've got to get through that bulkhead before Howell cuts the air down and gets us all. <laughs> Here's the bulkhead, Morgan. Where's the release? Under the floor panel. You can pry it up. All right, hurry. I got it, I got it. She's up. Wax on a key. Ready? All right, Morton. Open it up. Here it goes. Morton! He's dead. Electrocuted, and the bulkhead's still closed. He didn't even get to turn that key. It killed him instantly. Harry. Yeah. Have you got your watch gloves? They're insulated. Oh, yeah, sure. Get Morton out of the oh, way. Don't touch him, Joey. He's got the current through it. I'll shove him away with the gloves. All right, now. Stand by. Here goes a key. All right, let's go. Get him. Come on in. Stand back there. Stand back. Right, Flexi, are you like this? Guy? Right, grab the guns. Right, right. Joey, look out! Uh, let go of that gun, Howl. Uh, all right, hold them both. You don't have to worry about Black. I got him square with a wrench. We better tie up the captain. Yeah. Well, what do you think you're going to do now? We're going to turn around and go back home. <laughs> I don't think so. I burned the navigation tapes, and none of you can recalculate them. Why, you You dirty. just wander in space till the fuel gives out. You'll die right here on this ship. Screens went on. Meteor? No, no, it's a ship. A patrol ship coming up on us. Oh, they must have got an SOS off. Yeah, yeah. well, that's no, so no, sure that's so bad. <laughs> well, wait a minute, we don't have to worry. We can just tell them the truth. <laughs> You're not familiar with space code, young man. Mutiny is punishable by immediate execution. In other words, they don't ask questions. They just shoot. He's right, Jeff. We're through. Can we get away? Not from a patrol ship. 
already sent us a heave to flash. If we run, they'll blow us out of space. I'm afraid your mutiny is about over with, gentlemen. They'll be aboard in an hour. And ten minutes after that, you'll all be dead. Nobody move. Sergeant, take a squad and secure the ship. Collect all weapons and post a guard in the engine room. Yes, sir. You, Ralph, Williams, Osiski, come on. Well, I'm delighted to see you, Major. I wasn't quite sure my SOS had gotten through. Oh? You're Captain Howell? That's right. And I can swear out the affidavit of mutiny. I don't think a mutiny charge will stand up, Howell. Not with a relief of command warrant out for you. I think we'll just forget about it. But you can't do that. Space code is clear. You recorded my SOS. No, we didn't, Howell. Then how'd you get here? They sent us after you to get Jeff Coffin. Where is he? I'm Jeff Coffin. Jeff, we had a missing persons alarm for you, and then when a check you signed turned up at Marsport. A check? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. I gave one to Morton to help me get away. And he sold it to a fence for half face value. We traced it back to the ship. Coffin, I've got orders to escort you personally. We're taking you back to Earth. Uh, Can I send out a message, Major? Of course. Oh, well, that reminds me, Jeff. I've got one for you from your fiance. She said to tell you that she didn't object to a bachelor party in principle, but she did think six months was stretching it a bit. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Martian Death March. I've always been interested in lost causes. The revolt of the Scottish Jacobites against England. The last stand of the Cherokee and Sioux Indians. And the death march of the Martian Highlanders in 1997. There's been a lot written about that march... The U.N. Commission report covers four volumes, but the whole story isn't down on paper yet. I know it because I was on that march from the beginning to the end. There's one part of the story that no one ever mentions. The Martian Death March of 97 was led by an Earth man. Maybe you've been over the route of the march. There wasn't any highway there 30 years ago in 97. There was desert, hot, burning desert. I lived at the edge of the Kalmak Canal then with my father. He was a prospector searching the surrounding desert with sonar probe and Geiger counter, scratching just enough ore from under the Martian sands to pay for our grub stake the next year. I remember he was in the Adamson Digger in the North Quadrant when I came running out that day. Dad! 
There's somebody coming, Dad, across the desert. You sure? I saw them. They're a couple of miles out. Well, how many cars? They're on foot. On foot across the desert? Honest, Dad. I saw them. Are you sure it wasn't a light reflection off the canal? No. It was dark against the sand. I don't like that. You run back and get the rifles out. I've got to pull the digger into the shed. Is there going to be fighting, Dad? I don't know. I got a whole year's ore piled out back in the bins, and I ain't going to lose it to no claim jumpers. You go back to the shack and break out those rifles and see they're loaded, you hear? And jump! Dad had three surplus army rifles and a couple of homemade grenades made out of ore cans stuffed with Adamson A explosives. We crouched inside the shack, waiting. The shadow of the water tower in the doorway grew longer as the quick Martian dusk settled down over the desert. And there they come, Al. There's two of them. What's that on the first one's back? Why, I haven't seen one of those in 20 years. What is it? A one-man desert tank. They used to carry water that way before Adamson put out the air still units. There's something funny about that second one. Look, he's all spindly, and his head's funny. He's funny, all right. Al, that's a Martian. I never saw one off the reservation before. There hasn't been one, not in ten years. I don't like this. Here they come into the dooryard. You remember what I told you? Line up the sights and just squeeze the trigger. Hello! Hello there! Now, Dad? Hello! Wait a minute. What do you want? Water! I need water! Who are you? My name is John. John, huh? What are you doing with that spider? His name is Kantalka. I don't care what his name is. What's a human doing with a Martian? I found him in the dry bed of Kalmak Canal. Nearly dead of thirst. He probably ran off from the reservation. When our brothers are caged, they seek freedom. Brothers? Those spiders? All living creatures are our brothers. On Mars, as on Earth. Hey, wait a minute. Bert Olstrom at False Wells told me there was a screwball hedge creature over there hollering about letting the spiders loose off the reservations. Let no man call his own. No man, nor tribe, nor nation. <laughs> I guess that's you, all right. Bert told me they called you Crazy John. I don't suppose there's any harm in you. Fill your tank up at the air still. And uh, you can even have supper with us. We would be happy to. We? What do you mean, we? Cantal Carr and myself. That spider? Oh, no, I ain't having a Martian sitting down to eat with me. You come on, though. Thank you, sir. No. Where my brother is not welcome, I cannot go. Well, suit yourself. Al, get the key to the water tower. Come out here. All right, Dad. And put away the guns. We won't have any trouble from these two. The old man filled his tank at the air still tower, and the Martian went through the ash pile for half-burned fuel brick. When we went in the house for supper, I could see them silhouetted against the fire. The old man with his wild hair and beard, and the thin, spidery arms and legs of the Martian. Dad? What? Are all the Martians on the reservation? Yeah. All but a couple of wild ones in the mountains up north. The patrol catches a couple every year. Why? Well, they murder people. No, I mean, why are they on the reservation? Because it's the safest place to keep them. Pass this off. How many are there? Oh, I don't know. A few thousand. They keep dying off. Why? Well, they catch earth diseases. Chicken pox almost wiped out the whole gang of them two years ago. Chicken pox? I had that. It didn't wipe me out. Well, you ain't a Martian. I was born on Mars. Well, I mean you ain't one of those spiders. Now, eat your food. It'll get cold. Okay. Dad... Oh, what now? Were the Martians always on the reservation? Well, since the Outpost 3 massacre, they have been. What was that? Oh, back before you were born, they lived wild in the mountains up north. Were they fierce? Mm, fierce enough. Only place for them spiders, behind wire. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> Out in the dooryard, the campfire flickered at the base of the water tower. The first of the Martian moons had set. The other wouldn't rise for several hours. I could hear the sandkeepers out in the desert as I stood there. 
The old man and the Martian were sitting on the ground, huddled close to the fire. It gets cold fast on the desert when the sun goes down. Is that you, boy? You can come up to the fire if you like. My dad wouldn't like it. All right. But I'm not afraid of no spider. No, there is nothing to be afraid of. How come his arms are all skinny? Ask him. Does he talk? Yes, his name is Kantalka. It is, huh? Hello. Hello, boy. He talks funny. It is not my language. Why isn't he on the reservation? You can get in trouble helping spiders to escape. No man has the right to imprison the innocent. They that are enslaved will be freed. They that are in sickness and misery will be comforted. They that are exiled in a strange place will be restored. My dad says the spiders are treacherous, cowardly, murdering savages. That's what he says. Boy, there was a time on this world when there were no earthmen, when the ships and the machinery of earth were unknown. Then the people of the highlands lived in peace. But today they are a handful, starving, dying behind the wire. But the reservation isn't so bad. Our home is in the mountains of the north, not the desert. I heard a voice which cried out to me in the desert, Go to your brothers. Do they really call you crazy, John? I have been called many things. You really think we ought to let those old spiders off the reservation? Boy, we die here in the desert. We die in the sun and of the sicknesses you have brought from Earth. That's because Martians are just weak. I'll bet I could knock you down myself. You could. We are a different people. We have not the strength of muscle of Earthmen. But we will not stay here to die. You won't get off the reservation. The patrol takes care of all that. They won't let any stinking old spiders out. Ah, even in the minds of children is planted the poison of evil. How long? That night through the window, I could see the flicker of the old man's campfire. He was walking up and down now, shouting singing hymns verse after verse, his white beard catching the light as he passed behind the fire. The Martian sat slumped over, his thin, spindly arms folded across the huge barrel chest that had developed over the centuries as the air of Mars thinned and escaped into space. In the morning, I looked out, and they were gone. Looking back now, we wonder how they did it. The high-voltage wire around the reservation carried a fatal charge. The patrolmen in the tower had 50-caliber machine guns. The desert around the camp was mined heavily. Yet, at dawn, August 7th, 1997, they broke out. I was down at the dried-up canal bed hunting sandpeepers when my father came running after me. Al! Al! Here I am. Come on, back to the house. What's the matter, Dad? You shut up and run! What is it? The spiders busted loose. Bert Olstrom radioed in. They come in here? They're headed this way, the murdering devils. They kill anybody? Six patrolmen when they busted through the wire. What are you going to do, Dad? Fire a keg of Adamson A across the gate. You get in there and get the guns out. I got the rifles and shoved a full clip in each one. Then I slipped a primer fuse and the homemade grenades and lugged them out to the porch. Dad was running lead wires back to a detonator from a half keg of Adamson A he'd set across the gate. There. And that's it. Now give me one of those rifles. Will they be here soon? You can see the dust over the rise. Murdering spiders. What'll they do? I don't know. Now make sure you get a good sight, Al. Don't waste any bullets. There they are, Dad. There they come. Oh, wait a minute. Hold up now. I want to get a good shot. Let them get closer. Dad... That's Crazy John up in front. There. He's taller than the spiders. You can see his beard. You're right. Oh, that renegade rat. He probably helped him break out of the reservation. Listen, Al. If anything happens to me, you ride out back to the shed. You can hide out in the empty ore bins till they go away. Now, you got that? 
All right, Dad. We're going to come in. The spider's shouting something, Dad. Probably a trick. Get down a little, Al. You're in the way. I got him clear now. Right in the head. Up a little now. <laughs> got him. Got him, Al. Dad, look out. They've got guns. Uh, down. Get down. Ooh. Get out, Al. Get out to the shed. Dad, you're, you're hit. Go on. Those spiders are going to rush. Now get going. No, no, I can't let Shut you. Shut up and get out of here. You hear? <laughs> get out of here. I ran back through the house to the shed. Behind me, I could hear the Martians sweeping up to the dooryard. Then suddenly the ground shook, and I could feel the dull concussion waves hit my ears as the Adamson A exploded. I could hear the high, whispered screams of the Martians and the rattle of fragments on the metal roof of the shed. I dived into the empty ore bin and slammed the hatch almost shut. I sat there waiting. Then suddenly a shadow fell across the edge of light, and the hatch slid open on top of me. You leave me alone. I'll kill you. Boy, I've been looking for you. Where's my dad? What did you do to my dad? He's dead. You killed him. You and those spiders. I'll kill you. I'll kill all those stinking, murdering spiders. They are our brother's boy. Your father shot without warning, and the fire was returned against my orders. You mean you weren't going to attack us? Our brothers came in peace. They are going home to their mountains. We came to get water for the journey. You mean you just wanted water? Yeah. Dad! Dad! <laughs> John, John, the Earth Patrol will be following us soon. We must go. And the boy? We'll have to leave him here with water and supplies. No, the Earth Patrol would question him. We need the time. He goes with us. They tore the Adamson air still from the tower and mounted it on poles. They piled our supplies in the yard and loaded them on their backs. And then they started. I marched with the old man at the head, and the column stretched out behind us on the desert. I turned to look back at our house. But the sun was behind it, blinding red. The old man pulled me around as he marched, his eyes fixed on the horizon, where far to the north rose the cool mountains that were the ancient home of the Highlanders. Fourteen of the Martians died the first day. They dropped to the side of the column where they could go no farther and died. But the march went on. On the fifth day, we swung wide to avoid a mining settlement, but not wide enough. The miners were in ambush behind a pile of rocks. I shall lead them home. Home to the promised rest. Home to the mountains. March forward. March forward. And the march went on. We wound across the desert in wild zigzags, following the paths the old man had traveled through the years. Only once a patrol plane hovered on the horizon and then shot away. The days went on. The weeks and the Martians died. They died of exhaustion. They died of the diseases we had given. And they died of thirst. The Adamson still could produce 27 units of water an hour, no more. And on that, they died of thirst. Here, boy, here's your water. But that's more than the others got. Take it. It's yours. You're giving me your water. It will be provided to me. He that brings justice to his brothers will drink deep of the water of righteousness. He that... Drink... Drink your water, boy. Across the desert, from the Kalmak Canal to Fever Dip, past the towering mesas of the Higgins Badlands, across the dry sea bottoms, they marched. On the 54th day of the march... We halted at evening. The air was thinner, colder now. The rations had long since been exhausted. 
I lay down to sleep wrapped in the old man's coat. Early in the morning, before sunrise, I woke suddenly. The ground mist that had covered the desert the night before was lifting slowly. I saw the old man standing by the burned-out fire, the vapor swirling around his legs in the cold light of the false dawn, edging his wild beard. Go back to sleep, boy. I can't. The end is near. I have led them through the wilderness, dry shod across the seas, and before us lie the mountains. You mean we're almost there? When the mist is taken from the eyes of man, the place of refuge can be seen. You mean the mountains? (coughs) It's over. We're there. (coughs) I, I have led them to their home, and I must go back to the desert. You mean alone? Now, now, even now, I hear a voice in the wind. Carry the message to the men of earth. Bring to this new world the message of the old. All beings created in the universe are my brothers. And he that harms my brother harms me. (coughs) Goodbye. Goodbye, boy. You'll be safe now. Goodbye, John. Goodbye. The Martians found him 500 yards from the camp, dead. Now the mist rose, and before us towered the highlands, the tall green mountains and the cool sky. The march was over. Of the 7,000 Martians who started, 900 were alive. They gathered now on the rise of ground and faced the hills. Their thin bodies wavered as they stood, and some dropped to the ground as they stood there. But there was a light of hope in their large, staring eyes. Most of them had died, but they had died on the way home. And now the march was over. Then the patrol planes were spotted on the horizon, and within ten minutes they had landed. The Martians stood silently as the squads piled out and set up the 50 caliber machine guns and the petroleum gel flamethrower. All right, you spiders. Hands up and stay together. Gather in a bunch and don't try anything. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Shoot the first spider that moves and shoot to kill. All right, where's that boy? There was a boy reported. Here I am. Uh, Oh, are you all right, kid? They hurt you? No, I'm all right. John gave me his water ration. Oh, the leader, huh? Well, I've got a warrant for him. Where is he? There. He's dead. Huh? Oh. Well, just as well. I'd hate to be him in front of a settler's jury. What are you going to do to them? The spiders? See those transport planes coming in? We're going to ship them all back to the reservation where they belong. You can't. You can't do that. What are you talking about, kid? You can't take them back. They're home. John said they were home. You can't take them back. It isn't fair. I won't let you. I won't let you. I won't let you. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Peel this crazy kid off me. All right, now, kid. Take it easy. I must be shot. Can't believe he's safe. Now. Yeah, I guess that's it. All right, you spiders. Step it up. Move along to those transport planes. It's all over now. You're headed right back to the reservation. They separated them in groups of 50 and loaded them on the planes. 900 out of 7,000. And soon the first big-bellied ships waddled out on the hard sands and lifted slowly into the air, headed back to the south, flying over the trail of dead and dying who started on the march to the highlands, the march to home. Don't worry about them spiders, kid. We'll take care of them. Come on now, kid. You'll feel better as soon as you get back. A civilization. I looked once more at the green mountains towering through the mist. And then, just before the motor raced, I saw John. Crazy John propped up against a dognut bush where the Martians had placed him. The wind from the south gave the wild hair and beard a rippling life. 
he faced the hills, the home and rest he had promised his brothers as he led them through the wilderness of Mars. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. Blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Castaways, by Ernest Kinoy. In the South Pacific, night comes on rapidly. The sun dips below the flat horizon, the sea is crimson for a moment, and then night falls. But on Tahani Atoll, giant arc lights turn night into day. Across the waters of the lagoon, within the barrier reef, launches and tugs skitter back and forth, while on the curving half-moon of the island, army trucks and jeeps scuttle down the rough roads bulldozed by the sea bees just six weeks ago. A low Quonset hut stands near the beach, surrounded by tangled wire. This is the preliminary command post, and inside is General Frank Gadash, field director of the test. Operation Destruction. Everything's on schedule, General. Radiological surveys complete. Instruments placement checked. Well, get me Navy and tell them each hour is as ordered. Send a periodic time check to Air Force on 90-week talk. And observation control on the Missouri. Yes, sir. I want a complete roster check on all personnel before each hour. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Nate Cohen wants to see you. Well, who the devil's he? AP man. He's been selected by the press radio pool to interview I you. haven't got any time. Tell him to speak to Major Dwight Vredenberg. He's the PRO. I think perhaps you'd better see him, sir. The, uh, the directive on public relations from Washington was very clear. Well, how in blazes am I supposed to run a bomb test and play mother hand to a bunch of reporters? Washington said... That all right, all right. Bring him in. Borelli? Yes, sir. Give me some black coffee, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Cohen, uh, General Gator. How do you do, General? Lousy, as a matter of fact. Is that an official statement? No. You can run some of that. The world is at the crossroads, baloney. I wrote that yesterday. General, what effect do you think the new bomb will have on the world situation? I can't tell you that, even if I knew. My job is to set the blasted thing off and see that nobody gets hurt and collect the data. Can I speak to you a moment, sir? Later, Alan. Go ahead, Cohen. Can you release anything on the scientific principles involved? I don't even understand them myself. There... Wait a minute. Dr. Muller? Yes? Come over here a minute, will you? Cohen, this is Dr. Fred Muller, civilian scientific director. He's the only one who knows what's inside that warhead. How do you do, Mr. Cohen? How about a statement, Doctor? Oh, I'm afraid all I'm allowed to say is that the bomb is new, it's extremely powerful, and off the record, it's very tricky and dangerous. What'll happen if it goes off prematurely? I don't think we have to worry about that. In fact, we wouldn't even know about it. If you'll excuse me now. How about the natives? Well, what about them? Aren't they going to be evacuated from the island? They already have been. General Gator. Oh, I, I saw the Tahani chief outside when I came in. The whole tribe squatting down at the motor pool, having a conference. What? Alan, I've been trying to tell you, sir. The, the Tahani are still on the island. Well, why? 
The LCTs are ready, aren't they? they? Yes, sir, but uh, they won't go. They refuse. The schedule called for their evacuation to Mailani three hours ago. I realize that, sir, but I hoped we could still get them off without violence. Look, Alan, they're either on the island or off. Now, wait a minute. Cohen, that's all. What are you going to do about the natives, General? Never mind. I'll issue a statement later. You're going to force them? Go on. Get out. I haven't got time. All right, General. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right, Alan. Let's have it. Well, sir, that honey been kicking up all along. They won't leave. They won't. Do they know what's going to happen to the island? Do they know that we're going to blow it higher than a kite? I told the chief. He, he just said they won't go. They'll go, all right, if I had to... Yeah, hey, get him in here. The chief? Yeah, and that, that lieutenant who interprets. Yes, sir. How do you like that, Dr. Muller? I haven't got enough trouble. You know, I feel rather sorry for the Tahani. Can't make much sense to them. We arrive and tell them they've got to get out. Look, I appreciate your finer feelings, Muller, but I can't let the Kanakas hold up the bomb test. They're not Kanakas, General. Captain Cook discovered the island in 1788. Well, what's the difference? Lieutenant Gilbert reporting, sir. Aloha, Kalahiri Metua Kunano. Hey, look, I haven't got time for ceremony, Gilbert. Tell the chief he and his tribe have got to get off the island. We're providing homes for them on Mailani. Translate, Gilbert. The chief says you do not understand. Mailani is a bad island. My people have lived on Tahani from the time that our ancestors were cast away on the island. The spirits of our ancestors are buried in the earth. Our fathers are buried here. Our fathers' fathers. If he thinks I'm going to move his graveyard, he's crazy. In our ancestors' time, the Tahani came in a great bird canoe. We were cast away on this island. We have made it our home. What right have you now to carry us over the sea to a strange land where we would die weeping for our homes? We will not go. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. Well, thank you, Dr. Muller. You're a great help. Say, Gilbert. Yes, sir. Tell him I have no choice. He's got till midnight to get his tribe on board those LCTs peacefully, or I'll have the Marine Detachment carry him aboard. Yes, sir. Isn't that rather harsh, General? After all, justice is on their side. We're preparing to blow up their island, and we haven't asked them about it. Dr. Muller, will you kindly confine yourself to the scientific aspects of this operation? I'll take care of administrative matters. If you could explain to them what's at stake here. Any further explaining I've got to do, I'll do with the Marine detachments. I'm not going to hold up my schedule. Well, Gilbert? I, I told him, sir. All right, get him out of here. I've had enough. Oh, no, no, Koala. What the devil's that? Some kind of a curse, sir. I can catch some of it. The island will remember the tears of its children and punish the invaders. The great destroyers will not destroy. And the evil man who is the chief will travel far through the blackness of night. Even as the children of the island end, so will he. All right, Gilbert, take him away. You in here, sir. You Colonel in here. Allen. Get a detail from the Marine Detachment with tear gas and small arms down to the motor pool. And in one hour, have those natives on that transport, and I don't care how they do it. Is that my coffee, Varelli? Yes, sir. They must know about the bomb. The great destroyer will not destroy. You worried about that curse? I should think you might be. He threatened you personally. If I were you, I'd carry a pistol till they got off the island. The chief looked as if he'd cheerfully strangle you with his bare hands. I'm supposed to end the way they do. Huh? What's that? Probably the Tahani saying goodbye to their island. I think I'll go down to the motor pool. Well, stay out of the way. And get back here in an hour. We've got to have this wrapped up and headquarters moved out to the Missouri by dawn. <laughs> Instrument room checking in, sir. That's the last. Have the Missouri take over control and send for my jeep. Yes, sir. Are the LCT standing by for those natives? Yes, sir. They're on the beach. The bomb unit is assembled in place, General. 2330, right on the nose. Robin, start evacuation procedure. The Tahani, you've stopped. Alan's probably moving him out to the beach. Check in with Navy and Air Force, Borelli. Yes, sir. What's that? Coming from the beach. The Tahani making trouble. Come on. General. Hey, you, Gilbert, what is it? Colonel Allen ordered the Marines. Well, here. what happened? The natives just got up and started marching. Did they embark? You don't understand, sir. They marched up the cliff and right off into the lagoon. What? All of them. The women and the kids, too. They didn't even try to swim. What were you doing all this time, just standing around with your thumb in your mouth? Where was the Marine detachment? We couldn't stop them, sir. They just walked over the cliff. They didn't even scream, not even the kids. 
We sent the crash boats out, but we couldn't get them any of them. The crazy idiots. Were there any reporters there? Well, Cohen and a life photographer. Well, get his film and hold it till I release it. What are you going to do, General? Postpone H hour? It's too late for that now. And calling H hour off isn't going to bring the natives back. But 100 men, women, and children just walking into the water. It's, it's horrible. I know. I'm not happy about it either. There's nothing we can do now. I gave him a chance to get off. I was just thinking about the curse the chief put on you. Even as the children of the island end, so will he. That's what he said to you, General. I know, I heard him. Your jeep's waiting, General. The great destroyer will not destroy. That must mean the bomb. Don't worry, Dr. Muller. It'll take more than a mumbo-jumbo curse from a native witch doctor to stop this operation. At each hour, that bomb goes off. H hour minus one minute, 30 seconds. H minus one thirty. Video screen's hooked in, sir. All right, check control stations. Observation station one. Observation station one, check. Radiation station. Radiation control, check. Test the firing Observation circuit, Dr. Two. Muller. All right, General. Two, Damage control station. Damage control, check. All set. Communications. Communications, check. All checked in, sir. It is H minus one minute. H minus one Take a good look at that island on that screen, Dr. Muller. When you throw that key, it just won't be there anymore. Nothing but an atom mushroom over the lagoon. Quite a funeral pyre for the Tahani. Stubborn idiots. They can't get in the way of progress. Progress? I wonder if it is, General. It is H minus 30 seconds. H hour minus 29, 28, 27, 26. The Great Destroyer... That's what he called the bomb. Hold it, Muller. Allen, report. All checked in, sir. Camera's running. Sound fire warning. Stand by for firing. Ready, Muller? Ready. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Fire! General didn't go off. The bomb didn't go off. Borelli, signal standby, condition red. Yes, sir. Alan, check readings. Muller, what's wrong? What happened? I don't know. The bomb didn't go off. Well, what do you mean? Why didn't it? I don't know, except for one thing. The Tahani chief said the great destroyer would not destroy. It didn't, General. The bomb didn't go off. How about it, General? What happened? Have you got a statement? Nothing you can use, Cohen. Not till we find out what went wrong. Hey, who let you come aboard this ship? I walked on. You don't know why the bomb failed? It didn't fail. It just didn't go off. What's that tank thing on the deck, General? Undersea salvage unit, Mark IV. They call it a bottom crawler. Somebody going down? Well, that bomb is down there in the lagoon somewhere. Could go off at any second. Somebody's got to go down and find it and disarm it. That's a lovely job. Who's elected? I am. Wow. And Dr. Muller. He's the only one who knows how to dismantle it. All is ready, General. All right. Come on, Muller. I'm ready. Alan, as soon as we hit shallow water, get those gates open. We'll pull the crawler out. And then you get away in a hurry. If that bomb goes while we're working on it, I don't want any casualties. Yes, sir. Inside, Muller. All right. I'm in. Now, remember, get this LST out of the lagoon in a hurry. You got that, Alan? You take your orders from Admiral Yancey. Yes, sir. Good luck. Closing the hatch. The radar and Geiger counter warmed up, Muller. I was just thinking of something, General. That curse, part of it came true. The bomb didn't go off. Well? The second part of that curse was that you would end where they ended. That was at the bottom of the lagoon. What are you trying to do, Muller? Nothing. Nothing. I was just thinking this crawler is going to take us right down there where the Tahani died. I'm not worried about a handful of dead natives, Muller. I'm worried about that bomb. Okay, they're opening the gate. Let's go. USU-4 to control. 
Depth, 50 feet. Bottom, sandy. Dropping off, sharp. Anything on sonar, Muller? School of fish. <laughs> you ever been down in a crawler before? Only in the tank at New London. I think I've got a Geiger reading dead ahead. Hang on. Getting something on sonar now. Left to point. USU-4 to control. Over. USU-4 to control. Over. It's a fine note. The radio's out. Dead ahead. Looks too large to be the bomb. Can't see much on the forward vision plate. Hey, wait a minute. That's part of the reef ahead. That's where the guy in the reading indicated. The bomb must have settled in a hole in the reef. We'll have to go after it in diving suits. The suits are in the locker. Let's get this over with. The less time I spend down here waiting for that bomb to blow, the better I like it. Muller, is your helmet clamped tight? You getting me all right on your headset? Okay. I'm going to fill the lock. Here goes the outer door. Let's go. This isn't like that diving tank in New London. Look out for that coral. It can cut you to ribbons. There's a hole of some sort there. Where till I get the light up? See if you can get a Geiger reading out of that hole. Just a... There. It's down there, all right. Careful. I'll drop down first. <laughs> See anything down there? Muller, get down here fast. What is it? Find something? The bottom of this hole, it's... It's metal and the sides. But, but it's the coral reef. Look, welded joints. These are hull plates of some kind. And... Look out, above us. It's closing. Grab it. Too late. A metal hatch. It just slid over the top. This is impossible. What's going on? It's like an airlock. The water's being pumped out. General, do you realize what this means? I'm not sure. There's an inner door opening. Careful. What do we do now? There isn't much we can do. We can take off our helmets, though. The dial shows good air. <clears throat> All right. Come on. What is this? An undersea fort? What's it doing here? What does it mean? Whatever it is, our bomb must be down here. Wait. There's someone there. I, I can't see. There, there's a shadow. Who is it? Who's there? Welcome, Dr. Muller. Welcome to our ship. We've been waiting for you. General, it can't be. Do you see it? It's the Tahani chief. How long has the bottom crawler been down, Borelli? Four hours, sir. Two since we lost contact. Now, keep trying. Yes, sir. I've given him enough time. I'm going to send another crawler down. What do you figure happened to him, Colonel? Well, there are a lot of things. Hey, how did you get in here? I walked in. When are you going to release this, Colonel? It's the biggest story since the election. Bomb are dead and Dr. Muller and General Gaydash dead. They're not dead. At least we don't know they are. As long as that bomb doesn't go off, there's still a chance. That... What happened? Bomb. Curly, condition red. Gilbert, radiation control into action. Get the hot squad into Tahani Lagoon as soon as it's cleared. And get me a PT boat with radiation screen. What is it, Colonel? What happened? The bomb must have blown. How about Muller and the general? If they were down there in that lagoon, you guess. Now get out of my way. I'm busy. Radiation reading, 75 and steady. Take her in as close to the beach as you can. Steady as she goes. Is there any danger of any more explosions? No. When she goes, she goes. Radiation 82. That's still safe. Cohen, is that something on the beach? Yeah. Looks like a body. Maybe you blew one of the Tahani back out of the lagoon. No, no. It's moving. Gilbert, glasses. Yes, sir. It's a man, all right. Head into the beach. Who is it, Colonel? Can't tell. He's in a diving suit. It's either Muller or General Gaydosh. <laughs> Get his helmet off. Easy now. Twist to the right. There. It 
It's Muller. Uh... Gilbert, help me get him out of this diving suit. We've got to get him to the medics. <laughs> Radiation burns, superficial bruises, mild shock. He'll be all right, Colonel. Can he talk? For a while. Uh, bomb go off. It didn't. He's still out of his head. Quiet, Cohen. Go on, Dr. Muller. What did you find? A ship. A giant metal ship there under the lagoon. A submarine? No, no. It was a spaceship. Space ship? Space? Camouflaged right next to the reef. When, when we went inside, we found the Tahani chief and all the tribe. Alive. What? They drowned in the lagoon. I saw them. No, they didn't commit suicide as we thought. They just dived underwater into the rocket airlock. Rocket? Airlocks? Now, look, Muller, I know you've suffered a shock, but... But it's true. It can't be. A spaceship built by Polynesian savages. But they're not savages. They're the castaways. They're from another planet. Don't you understand? Their spaceship was wrecked here 400 years ago. They've been waiting ever since for a chance to go home. He's out of his mind. Better give him a sedative, Doctor. No, 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 wait a minute, Colonel. Remember their story about the great bird canoe? Maybe there's something to the legend. Not the legend, it's true. They'd exhausted their fuel, came down out of space, couldn't find anything here on Earth to replace their fuel source until we developed atomic power. Atomic power? You mean they stole our bomb? That's right. Fished it out of the lagoon, hauled it aboard. Yes, but how could they convert it to atomic drive? They made me dismantle it for them at the point of a gun. Then just before they blasted off, they let me go. But what about the general? Remember the Tahani curse? I see. You mean they killed him? You don't understand. I said I dismantled that bomb at the point of a gun. It was General Gaydash who was holding the gun. What? He was one of them, one of their spies, sent out to bring back the rocket fuel they needed. And the Tahani curse wasn't a curse at all. It said that when they left the island, so would he. I mean, he's with them now. Yes. And after 400 years, the castaways are going home. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith. Publishers of astounding science fiction. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. Blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, First Contact, by Murray Limester. They had been in space six months now, moving with the incredibly faster-than-light speed of the overdrive. In six months, they had gone from Earth outward and outward to the crab-like nebula with the twin stars a routine flight of exploration and scientific research. 
Solid object about 90,000 miles away, sir. Located, Dort. Exactly. Identify it. A small object, sir. Captain, I've never seen anything like this before. Whatever it is out there is coming toward us at an incredible speed and retreating to zero just as rapidly. What's the mass of the object, Dort? Well, it varies with the distance from us, sir. Step up the scanners. Nothing, sir. Absolutely nothing shows out there. And yet there must be something. Those alarms are foolproof. Action stations, man all weapons. Condition of extreme alert in all departments immediately. Captain, what is it? Dort, I ran into the same thing once before on the Earth-Mars run. We were being located by another ship, and their locator beam was the same frequency as ours. Every time it hit, it registered as something solid and monstrous. But, Captain, we're the only Earth ship in 18 light years around. How? I didn't say it was another Earth ship out there, Dort. Another race? That's right. There's a spaceship out there, all right. But it's not manned by human beings. It had been contemplated and speculated upon. Mathematically, it was almost a certainty that such a race existed. But in 18,000 Earth years, no human spaceship had ever encountered them. Now the situation was precipitated, and somewhere outside the Earth vessel, there was an alien race. Of what shape? Of what quality? Of what psychology? It's moving, sir. Heading right for us. That speed will be in touch in ten minutes. Heading right for us, huh? Just what we'd do if a strange ship appeared in our hunting grounds. Friendly? Well, maybe. We'll try to contact them. We have to do that. But friendly? Thank the Lord for the blasters. They may not be hostile, sir. They may be. That's what I'm paid for. Put on this job for to worry about the troubles that may never happen. To all hands, now hear this. A ship is approaching manned by an alien race. I'll give the signal for attack or defense if it be necessary. There'll be no move made unless I give the order. I do not wish to provoke trouble. Stand by. Their ship is slowing down, sir. It's stopped. Weapons department, report. Weapons department, report. Alien ship remarked. Target fixed. Weapons alert. Communications department, report. Communications department, report. We're receiving a modulated short wave, sir. Frequency modulated. Apparently a signal. Not enough power to do us any harm. We'll try to make some sense out of it. Report any progress to me immediately. One thing in their favor, sir. They didn't attack immediately without question. They're trying to establish contact. That seems to indicate they're reasonable. We'll see, we'll see. What are they doing now? Can you make out the locator screen? Bring that power up. Uh, They're doing something now, sir. There's a section of the hull opening. Probably an airlock, sir. If they breathe air. They're letting something out. It's round. A bomb, sir? Unknown object released from alien ship. Observed by weapons department and targeted. Stand by. See what they're doing, sir? They've left the object out there right where they were. And now they're withdrawing the ship. There's no reason why that object couldn't be a bomb, Mr. Dort. Intended to let us think precisely as you're thinking right now. I just have a hunch, sir. I think they're friendly. I think whatever it is out there is a means of communication. You're probably right, but I won't gamble the ship on a probability. Sir, I'd like to volunteer to go out there and look that thing over. You understand whoever does examine it is expendable. Yes, sir. Requisition a lifeboat. If it's all right with you, sir, I'd prefer just a suit with the drive in it. It's smaller and the arms and legs won't make me look like a bomb. And I'll carry a scanner, sir. You may leave when you're ready. Thank you, sir. I'm all ready. Clear the lock and let me out. Weapons department reporting to the captain... Mr. Dort located. Mr. Dort is targeted. Stand by. And that object out there is a device to capture one of our people for observation and questioning. It'll be blown out of existence, including Mr. Dort. Stand by. Mr. Dort. Mr. Dort. Report. Object, as you can see on the scanner, sir, is covered with many small horns, like the detonating horns of the obsolete mines formerly used in naval warfare. Is that their purpose? Do you assume, Mr. Dort? I'm going to find out, sir. I'm going to grab one. Mr. Dort? I'm here, sir. I don't think this is a mine. Circle it so we can see it completely through your scanner. Deadlock, sir. 
Nothing to report that the scanner hasn't shown you. Oh, wait a minute, sir. A section of the outer hull seems to be opening. Do you see it? Very good, Dart. Hold that. I'm sure it's a communications device, sir. Uh, it looks like it. Fix your scanner so it'll focus on that communications device. Return to the ship. Communications department. Communications department. Progress report, please. We've established communication, sir. Is there a psychologist on the team down there with you? Yes, sir. Mr. Burns is working with us. Will both of you please report to the bridge at once? Oh, you look tired, Dort. We've established fairly satisfactory communication, sir. They seem to have highly developed thought patterns. We got a satisfactory translation from the machine on the fourth attempt. We can say almost anything we want to say to each other now. Of course, how much of what they tell us is the truth, we have no way of knowing. Mr. Burns, you're the psychologist. What do you think? Well, I don't know, sir. They seem to be completely direct. They haven't let slip even a hint of the tenseness we know exists. They act as if they were setting up a means of communication for friendly conversation, but, well, there's an overtone that... Yeah. Well, Mr. Burns, I have a decision to make. On the one hand, opening contact with the friendly people of a vastly different culture could only be beneficial to us of very... On the other hand, if they're hostile, I ought to blast them out of existence without any other preliminaries. Oh, but, sir, you can't... I'm not talking to you, Dort. It's not warranted yet, sir. Yes. <clears throat> now, hear this, all departments. Hear this, all departments. This ship is on an extended alert. Provisions will be made so that personnel can have maximum rest and nourishment. Communication continued by means of the artificial language set up arbitrarily between the Earthman and the aliens, decoded by the mechanical decoders. Dort disobeyed orders. He lived on powerful stimulants so that he could stay with the communications machine. Talking, talking, talking to the aliens. Other people, other people, are we being received? We are are receiving your message. The chief of this ship wishes to speak with the chief of your ship. The message is heard by the chief of this ship. The chief of this ship communicates that he will hear the message of the chief of that ship. Go ahead, sir. People of the other ship, I'd like to say the appropriate things about this first contact of two dissimilar civilized races and of my hopes that a friendly intercourse between the two peoples will result. People of that ship, what you say is all very well, but is there any way for us to let each other go home alive? That's all, sir. They've stopped sending. Very direct people. Very direct. But, sir, I don't follow. I didn't know what that meant. You know, is there any way for us to let each other go home alive? It means what it says, Dort. Sir, what's to stop us from just cutting communication and leaving, and they can do likewise? What's to stop us? Simply that whichever ship leaves first will be followed by the other. If they find Earth and get back to their own planet, and we don't know where that planet is, Earth will be completely at their mercy. If they leave first, we'll follow them. We'll attempt to find their home planet. Dort, could you swear to any decision that the policymakers on Earth will come to? Sir, even if they do follow us, the closer we get to home, the more of our ships and weapons they'll face. How They'd you... never get away. Well, how do you know that they can't communicate with their home planet without returning? We can't, sir. How do you know they can't? They don't, sir. Well, so that's the situation. We'll sit out here, facing each other, trying to outguess each other, until time wears us out, and we'll have to face the fact either they destroy us or we destroy them. Navigation officer, attention. Navigation officer, attention. Every star map on this ship is to be prepared for instant destruction. The chief of this ship wishes to know whether the chief of that ship can suggest an answer to the problem concerning us both. Do you want me to answer that, sir? I'll answer it myself. Tell me when to talk. Now, sir. I am giving that matter personal attention. Every effort will be bent to the solution of this problem. Will you consider a temporary truce in the meantime? What would a truce gain? 
Could we trust you? Would you trust us? I suggest that we continue as we have up to this particle of time. I agree. Sign off, George. Weeks went by, and during the weeks, the exchange of information continued without let-up. What particle of time are the people on that ship at? The resting time. All rest except myself and others on alert duty. Same on this ship. You people of that ship are very similar in many ways. Do you have a family? I have a mate. I have a mate and three offspring. It is too bad for them, as well as us, to have to kill each other. This ship can't see any way out of it. Can that ship? If we could believe each ship, yes. Our chief would like it. But we can't believe you, and you are afraid that we do not tell truth, although we do. This ship would trail you home if this ship were able to. That ship would do the same. But this ship feels sorry about it. I believe you're a friend. I share your belief and like you. But there is a possibility that you were put to make a trap for me. I will stop now and think it over. Sit down, Dort. Control yourself. We're all under tension. Doesn't do any good to pace like some caged animal. Yes, sir. All right, now, I've read the complete transcription of your conversations with this one alien. What does it prove, Dort? Sir, these people are so much like us in their thinking. Well, sir, they're likable. They're likable and they breathe oxygen. Their air is 28% oxygen instead of 20. But they could do very well on Earth. It would be a highly desirable conquest for them. Dort, I'm as set against violence as you are. I don't see any way out of this. And I think we've got to break this status quo. So if in 70 hours we don't see any other way, then I have no further choice. I'll blow them to bits. Receive communications. Will that ship receive communications? This ship is listening. It seems to me better to communicate than to sit by the machine silently. I would have called you, but you signed off before. The problem goes around and around. I find no answer. Perhaps we could turn our thoughts to other things. The psychologist of this ship tells us that you people on that ship have a threshold of tolerance to tension. He tells us that you will be forced to take one action or another in a period of less than a hundred time particles. I have no communication on this matter. Well, this ship is not trying to extract unwilling information from that ship. A truth is mentioned in passing. A report of this conversation will be carried to the chief of this ship. It would be so. We are prepared. If only the people of this ship could meet in direct contact with the people of that ship, it might be better. We could not communicate then. The communications machine is too large to carry from place to place. And direct contact, the peoples of the two ships would be further apart than now. That's true. I am sad. Much that is pleasant has passed between us. I am sad, too. We are not yet ready for each other. We are not yet ready for each other. It's hard, isn't it, Doc? <laughs> well, Captain, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were here, sir. I've been here for quite a while. Eavesdropping, I'm afraid. It's all right, sir. Nothing can be personal in a situation like this. Yeah, that's right. How long is a hundred time particles, Dort? Pardon, sir? That reference he made to us not being able to stand tension is interesting. Their psychologists seem to make more out of us than we do out of them, don't they? Yes, sir. They hit the nail right on the head. Yes, they did. I think, Dort, we'll just have to push our timetable up a bit. 
No further communication with the aliens under any circumstances. That's clear, isn't it? Yes, sir. Sir, if they know so much about our psychology, isn't it possible that remark was intended to make us act more quickly? Probable, Dort. Probable. Well, why would they do that, sir? Why? You tell me why, Dort. Mm, all of a sudden, I have an idea, sir. It's crazy. Yeah, it doesn't matter how crazy. I'll listen to it. Sir, I think these people are playing some kind of a joke on us. Joke? A joke, Dort? Yes, sir. Over and over again, I've noticed what I think is a sense of humor. A highly developed sense of humor. Do you recall when we went to all the trouble to set up a fictitious star map and then they just sent us back a, a mirror image of the same one? I think somehow they're playing a joke on us. Well, maybe you're right. In which case, you've seen practical jokers, Dort. Their jokes aren't always funny. Sometimes they hurt people. All departments, man, instant alert. All departments, man, instant alert. Report instantly. Report instantly. Weapons department alerted. Target, the enemy ship. On target, sir. Stand by. Fire! They're gone, sir. Not a trace of them left. Not a tiny trace. Now we can go home. Communications to Captain. Communications to Captain. Report. Sir, I'm picking up new signals. Same frequency as the original alien signals. That's impossible. That ship was destroyed. I'm receiving signals, sir. Set the machine up. We'll be down there in a minute. Mr. Dort, come with me, please. It's good to be on the way home. Yes, it is good. Do you suppose we'll ever figure out what happened to the other ship? Never. A blinding flash and, and they were gone. I suppose they couldn't figure a way out of the situation. An unstable people. They had no sense of humor to cope with the situation. They exploded themselves out of existence. It seems reasonable. They must have had powerful weapons to destroy themselves so completely. Yes, what a shame. In a way, I grew to like them. This isn't meant for us, sir. I don't know what's happening, but I think we're overhearing a private conversation. Yeah, I understand, Dora. Be quiet, will you? Many things might have come out of a relationship with that people. They were describing a disease they call cancer. I think it is similar to the Frogren syndrome. We might have helped them. They might have helped us, too. Well, too bad. We'll never find them again, I think. The odds of such a chance meeting in the vast space of the whole universe. There are no figures for such odds, are there? Turn it up, Dort. Turn it up louder. That's all there is, sir. The signal stopped there. Sir, I don't know how, but somehow when we fired at them, we didn't destroy them, but we did set up a condition whereby they've become invisible to us and we've become invisible to them. Captain to engineering department. Halt, forward motion. Captain, why are we stopping? Listen, Dodge, you say they're invisible. They are, but they're not destroyed because we just heard them. They're out there somewhere. Invisible. Well, you heard them, so they're heading for home. We're invisible to them, too, sir. How do you know, Dodge? How do you know this whole thing isn't a setup? Well, suppose that's true, Captain. You heard their conversation. They weren't talking like any monstrous people. They seemed decent and warm, just as decent and warm as we are. How do you know this conversation wasn't planned? Deliberately set up for us to hear. How do you know that, Dort? Yes, sir, you're right. They may be out there and they may not. They may be telling the truth or they may be trying to trick us. They may be friends or they may be the most deadly enemies. You said they had a sense of humor, Dort. <laughs> what a joke to play. To deliberately set up a situation where we wouldn't know fact from fantasy, truth from lie. Wouldn't that be a joke, Dort? Yeah, but we don't know that they did that, sir. And we don't know that they didn't. We don't know anything. Sir, does that mean we never go home again? I don't know. I have to think about it. I have to think about it. <laughs>
You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you First Contact, written by Murray Leimster and adapted for radio by Howard Rodman. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes, Bob Hastings, Clark Gordon, William Lally, and Stan Early. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. (laughs) 